Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and today I'm going to be looking at a video by Mr. Thrive and Survive where he claims that umbras and penumbras are hoaxes. Hey everybody, Rich Mr. Thrive and Survive. This video is going to look at the science, and we're going to do science, actual uh, real observations here. Oh, a flat earther actually doing science for once. This should be fun, or disastrous. Uh, to see if what NASA and mainstream scientists has been trying to sell us and which has been universally accepted without question is the umbra penumbra that is created by the sun, moon, and earth. Whatever. The reason why umbras and penumbras are universally accepted is because they can be demonstrated. It's not NASA trying to sell a lie. Depending on the, you know, the type of eclipse you're looking at, and what we're going to be looking at here is, uh, you know, this comes from my Jupiter video. I'll Something to note is that this image here that he's got on screen is going to be very important later on. Okay, I had to uh, cut in here just to show the ridiculousness of the comparison between the two and how off the shadow really is on Jupiter. Uh, let's look at this, and let's look at Lake Okeechobee over here. Uh, Lake Okeechobee in Florida is uh, just under 30 miles, 39.85 miles wide. So it's, uh, you know, you double that, you get 80 miles. So you double this, that would be the shadow that the um, solar eclipse made across North America as it was going across. Well, actually, that would just be the umbra of the shadow. The pen umbra covers a much larger area. So let's take a look at that just real quickly, and we're going to compare that to Jupiter. But anyway, that is a 70 mile wide shadow uh, that we would see on the Earth. So what does that look like if we zoom out? Uh, we're going to select this, and we're going to copy it and move it to around the middle of the country where it went through. So if we had a satellite picture like we had with Jupiter, what would that look like? There we go. Look at that. Little teeny little dot. Although that dot there isn't actually what an eclipse should actually look like on Earth, because you're forgetting the penumbra. But I can help you out here. I'll just set up my NASA CGI. And it's going to take an hour. I'll be back when it's done. Yes, I know that adding an eclipse in there is taking a lot of processing power up. And I know that it's taking away from Himawari. But this is to shut up a flat earther. And look, it's almost done. Five, four, three, two, one, done. There we go. You got your processing power back, okay? Bye. Anyway, it's finally done. So this is what the shadow of the moon actually should look like on Earth from space. And this is all to scale, by the way. Now, let's compare that to Jupiter. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a little bit difference, huh? So his argument essentially boils down to, look at this photo from NASA which shows the shadow of Io on Jupiter. And when you compare that photo to what you'd expect to see the shadow of the moon on the Earth, it is huge. So according to Mr. Thrive and Survive, that must mean that the photo by NASA is fake. However, let's bring up a graphic from earlier on in this video. Height from which the photo was taken matters. It also says, when the photo is taken from small altitude above the surface using wide angle lens, or it is a composition of multiple shots, the photo is covering only a small part of the hemisphere. So when it comes to the photo of the shadow on Jupiter, it looks as though it would be using a wide angle lens, which would accentuate the curve, as well as make the shadow appear bigger than what it actually is. And, uh, you know, if we have to... Uh... Uh, well, let's do this. Let's, let's look at the difference here. Now, you're going to say, oh, you're not showing all the Jupiter. Well, go look at my other video. Not everyone has the time to go through all of your videos, Mr. Thrive and Survive. And uh, go to uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory site that I left a link to where you can see the entire disc. So unlike a lot of flat earthers, I actually did what Mr. Thrive and Survive suggested and checked his sources, which gave me this image here. This confirms that they used a wide angle lens, because that is the only way you'd get Jupiter looking like that. Maybe, I don't know, try using an image that's taken from further away when you try to compare one thing to another. But uh, let's compare Jupiter's size to the Earth. Here we go. Look at all these Earths that can fit into the side of Jupiter. So how big would the speck be? 
There is no comparison. Only cognitive dissonance would allow you to destroy your own thinking here and say, oh, they're pretty much comparable, Rich. No, your comparison is just plain shit. You're using a wide angle lens view of Io's shadow on Jupiter when you should be using something taken from much further away. There may be many other issues with your approach, but that is the one that you need to fix first and foremost. There's a little bit different angles and the umbra pen Oh yeah, umbra penumbra. Let's get into that, because this is the heart of the meat of the matter right here. Yes, let's get into it. This should be fun. Okay, back to the video that was sent to me. Now granted, this is going to sound a little weird pulling in the Kennedy assassination here. Are you kidding me? I'm just going to skip ahead to when he actually makes a point about umbras and penumbras. What can our logic tell us about the umbra penumbra? Are we making an assumption that just, just like the Kennedy assassination, that what the government tells us, just because what NASA tells us, it's true? But this isn't just an assumption. This can be tested and verified for yourself, as long as you understand it. All right, now I have to use a disclaimer. Do not use a local light that's inside the house or inside your garage or something like that. If I did that, I would be absolutely hammered without end. Of course, it completely depends on your light source. If you've got a huge light source, then that can work. All we have to do is use the real sun. Here's the argument. It's always, because the sun is larger, because the sun is larger than the object that is blocking the sun, we get this umbra penumbra effect. Just a little nitpick, you'd still have an umbra if you had a smaller light source. That umbra just wouldn't be smaller than the object casting the shadow. And we have the shadow, as you can see here, it comes down to a point, and then it goes the other way. Totally ridiculous, but we're not going to get into that. I've gotten into that in other videos. I am just at a loss for words as to his stupidity. I don't even know how to begin to explain how wrong he is. When the sun's rays in that diagram come down to a point, that has nothing to do with the umbra or penumbra. Because what's ridiculous about it is, at 93 million miles, the rays are virtually parallel and they do not spread out in space without an atmosphere. Virtually parallel, as in, they're not completely parallel. That's an important thing to note. All you have to have is a larger sun and a smaller moon or a smaller blocking object. That is the whole thing. If, let's look at something local using the same sun that is used in eclipses. Now this is simply a telephone pole that I shot earlier today. And you'll see how it does when it uh, is very long in length. And uh, this is the actual physics that we can actually prove ourselves in person. What are the odds that he observes an umbra and a penumbra, but just dismisses it? So let's take a look at it from a purely scientific and observational point of view. What do we have here? No matter what object we use on Earth, it's going to be smaller than the sun. So we've, we've got a larger sun. And let's just say we had a blocking object that was located here. So here we have an object. And what if we were somewhere in here? What kind of shadow size should we see according to this diagram? Well, we should have something like that, right? So an important thing to note is that would just be the umbra of the shadow, not the entire shadow. This type of simplistic thinking about shadows is definitely going to lead to some errors. Because the argument is the farther you're up in the cone, the larger the shadow that would be produced. Yeah, something like that, right? So the closer we get to this focal point, the smaller the shadow would be. And then, of course, when we come out on the other side, uh, the further we get away from it, the larger the shadow should be also. Our survey said... <coughs> so it seems that Mr. Thrive and Survive is conflating umbra, shadow, and antumbra. So it's very important when you're talking about this to actually know the definitions. So for example, the umbra is the part of a shadow where no light from the light source can reach. The antumbra, on the other hand, is a part of a shadow where the object that's blocking the light is blocking as much light as it can, but it is not large enough to block all the light. And another very important thing to note here is that the further that you get into the antumbra, the lighter the shadow becomes because there's less light being blocked. And eventually there would be a point where the shadow would be so light that you can barely even call it a shadow anymore. 
if we have an object that is blocking sunlight, it should have uh, the properties uh, of that should go down to almost nothing, and then we should see that shadow come back out larger again on the other side. Nope, because that is completely ignoring the penumbra. So first things first, if you want to define a shadow as just its umbra, you're welcome to do so, but just don't include its antumbra. Now, if you are including the penumbra as a part of the shadow, then judging the size of a shadow becomes a lot harder. But we'll get into that later. Uh, the properties uh, of that should go down to almost nothing, and then we should see that shadow come back out larger again on the other side. Just so you know, that wasn't me just replaying that, he actually repeated that line in his video. He felt the need to repeat his own idiocy. How embarrassing. That's just the way it is, folks. That's what they're showing you. And that's the argument that they have for the umbra penumbra. So let's take a look at some real life situations. Now, as we cycle through these pictures, I want you to notice that we have things that are very close to the surface. We have clouds that are very high in the sky. We have clouds that are low in the sky. We have buildings. We have all kind of different things that are creating shadows. Wait, is he using Microsoft Flight Simulator as a real world example? I don't know if he realizes this, but Microsoft Flight Simulator is C G I. And again, as we cycle through these, I want you to tell me where we have an umbra penumbra on any one of these. Do you see it? Well, I certainly see the umbras on them. You might have to zoom in a little more to be able to see the penumbras because sometimes at distance, it's kind of hard to see that. Uh, here I am standing. I'm 6'3". You can see how low in the sky the sun was to produce a shadow this long. And here is the light pole that I showed earlier in this video. And what we're going to see is, as we get way out there, we're going to see how shadow degradation works. So rather than trying to call it umbras or penumbras, you're just going to call it, was that shadow degradation or degradation? First of all, measure the pole. And I'm just going to say the pole was eight, eight inches in diameter. I don't know what it really is, but we're just going to use that as an example. It would have helped if you had have actually, you know, measured it. What you will find is the shadow will never be greater than eight inches. Never. Are you sure about that? Now, what you will also notice is the shadow, when it is very close to the object, has no degradation whatsoever. However, once it gets beyond one diameter greater distance than the object itself you start to get a little bit of degradation if this is eight inches in diameter the first eight inches of this shadow will not have any degradation whatsoever it'll be a nice crisp sharp shadow no umbra no penumbra then as you get farther and further two diameters away three diameters away and on and on and so forth you get more and more degradation as you go out at about one diameter away, you get about a 1% degradation. So first off, that is not how any of this works. So there are a number of factors to what you are calling shadow degradation and to what everyone else calls the umbra and penumbra. There are two more variables aside from the diameter of the object and the distance to the object. There is the distance to the light source from the object and the size of the light source itself. I actually took it upon myself to work out the calculations for calculating the size of an umbra at any given distance from an object. So the width of the umbra can be expressed as the width of the object minus the difference in width between the object and the light source times the distance to the object over the distance between the light source and the object. Or this equation here for people that prefer to see it. Now I could take some time to work out the calculations for a penumbra but I really can't be bothered right now. So we'll just say that the umbra is always larger than the width of the object. So what this means is that if you get any distance from an object that is smaller than its light source, you get what Mr. Thrive and Survive calls shadow degradation. And the reason why someone might think that there's no shadow degradation is because if it's in such a small amount, you're just not gonna notice it. And the second point is he claims that there's no umbra or penumbra, but there is. You kind of don't have a shadow if you don't have an umbra or penumbra. 
So what you will notice is it degrades so badly when you get out so far that uh, it just starts losing, you start losing what the object actually was. Uh, more and more light bleeds through. You do not end up with an umbra penumbra. You have no sharp edge whatsoever after a certain distance. So I see what the problem is now. He thinks that umbras and penumbras have sharp edges, but they don't. He probably thinks that due to the diagrams that he's using, but I decided to make some of my own diagrams. Let's take a look-see. So this is what the effect of the umbra and penumbra actually is. No light from the light source reaches the umbra, but some light from the light source reaches the penumbra. You'll also notice that in the penumbra, the shadow gets darker the closer to the umbra it gets, and it gets lighter the further away from the umbra it gets. This is simply due to the closer you are in the penumbra to the umbra, the more light that the object is blocking, whereas the further away you are, the less light the object is blocking. And this is what blurs the borders of shadows. Now remember what I said earlier about it being difficult to tell the size of the shadow if you include the penumbra as part of the shadow. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to ask a simple question. Is this shadow here smaller or larger than the last one? It is certainly blurrier, but if we say that the whole penumbra is part of the shadow, then of course it is larger. But if we're just including the umbra, then it's smaller. Another thing is, if I were to take out the lines which show where the penumbra begins and stops, then it would be much harder to tell where that is. My point with all this is sometimes it's a little bit difficult to tell when a penumbra starts. It's not clearly defined like some diagrams show. And as for the whole point about shadows being bigger or smaller, some people might point to two different shadows and go, oh hey look, they're the same size. But one of them may be blurrier than the other. And that might mean that it's a little more difficult to work out where exactly that shadow starts. So according to the diagram, this should get smaller and then get larger again once we reach that focal point. That's just simply because you don't understand the diagram. If you look at my diagram, it matches up pretty well. But also, it kind of does get bigger as you go further down. This is why you should have taken measurements. If you look at the shadow in between the two posts, the distance between the two posts is roughly three and a half times the width of the shadow there. If we take your width for the diameter of the post to be correct, which is eight inches, then by your logic, the distance between the two posts must be 28 inches. Now this is a problem as those posts to me look to be more than a meter apart and a meter is over three times the length of 28 inches. Now if we assume that the distance between the two posts is one meter, then that must mean that the shadow there is at least three times the diameter of the telephone pole. Therefore, the shadow got larger than the telephone pole. It doesn't happen, folks. Unfortunately for you, Mr. Thrive and Survive, as evidenced by your own video, it does. But you know, Mr. Thrive and Survive's video is so bad that I think he might be onto something. Maybe, maybe NASA is part of this conspiracy where they're trying to stop people from looking directly into the sun, except for during a solar eclipse, because looking into the sun is good for you or something. God damn it, I'm gonna go look at the sun right now. The sun is gone. They've stolen the goddamn sun. So I think it's about time that I change things up slightly with these outros. You know, I try and condense them down a bit, make them shorter. Talking about this isn't helping. There will still be an outro, but it will mostly be for me to read off my $20 or more patrons. And sometimes there will still be something after the outro. So that's always a good reason to keep watching. But most people click away by now. In fact, there's probably only like one person watching. Hello to the one person that's watching. That's a good reason as any to leave a like and subscribe if you liked this video. That's probably the last time you'll hear me say that in a video, but I'll still keep between you and me. Thank you for watching.